on television, May 18th, 2010. Close Encounters. This episode suggests that alien encounters have been documented in various historical texts, citing as evidence the 13th century book Otia Imperialia, which describes an incident in Bristol, England, ascribed to UFOs. The log entries of Christopher Columbus that report lights in the sky. Stories of cigar-shaped craft allegedly seen over Europe during the Black Plague. And medieval art that supposedly depicts disc-shaped objects floating in the heavens. Hi, hello and welcome to Digging Up Ancient Aliens. This is the podcast where we examine the TV show Ancient Aliens. Do they claim hold water to an archaeologist or the better explanation out there? I'm your host, Frederick, and this is episode 7, Close Encounters, part 1. This episode we're in for a doozy. We have our first guest with us in just a moment. But before that... Remember that sources, resources and reading suggestions are attached to the show notes and on our website diggingupancientaliens.com. There you can find contact info if you find any mistakes or have any suggestions. If you like the podcast, I would really appreciate it if you left one of those fancy five-star reviews. I thank you by name in the next available episode. But let's dig down and get on with the show. All right, and we welcome our first guest to the show, Mr. Erik Palmgren, and he and I did study together, actually, at the University of Gotland, that is now called. Back in the days when we started, it was actually Högskolan på Gotland, um, but now it's part of Uppsala University, last time I checked it. Hi, Erik, how are you? Uh... Thank you for having me on uh, your show. I hope I have uh, uh, some insights uh, that would be uh, uh, beneficial for the discussions that we're going to have. Yeah, that's exciting Yeah, to be sure. And what do you do in your time? Oh, well, I am a hunter and gatherer in my free time as well. <laughs> uh, I, I prefer uh, going out uh, fishing. Um, and I also today work as a history and a religion teacher in a private high school. That's super great. And have you seen ancient aliens in the past? No. Uh, the, today was the first time I actually saw the program. I am a huge fan of uh, History Channel. Uh, I really uh, love the channel and, and most shows on it. but. Somehow this uh, this show have uh, slipped my mind, or at least I I haven't been catching it uh, in the past. Do you like History Channel, the old one that were mostly World War Two, or History Channel today that's mostly aliens and ice road truckers? <laughs> oh, and some well, porn. I, ice Oops. road truckers <laughs> is a great show. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, no, I, I, I prefer the, the old History Channel when they were speaking about uh, historic events that happened in the past. Uh, I, considering I do not own the, the channel today, uh, I, I cannot say that much about uh, its contents. But uh, from my understanding, uh, at least uh, today, the channel is a bit uh, of a mix between uh, uh, science and, uh, well, uh, hocus pocus. 
Yeah, I think they're actually starting to move more towards the hocus pocus. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunate yeah, for being an educational channel. But were you familiar with the ancient alien theories before? Well, I, I have heard uh, uh, some of them, at least, uh, uh, after watching this episode today. Uh, I, there were uh, quite a few new ones that I haven't heard of before. Uh, the only ones that I did know about before were, uh, well, theories about the aliens creating the Great Pyramids in Giza and Stonehenge and so on. But... Uh, None of that were discussed, at least in the show that I watched today. No, Stonehenge make an appearance actually in the last episode of the season. Okay. That's actually the first European um, European monument they talk about. Otherwise, it's just South America, Mesoamerica, Native Americans, Africa, or Asia. Okay. Peans have avoided uh, aliens for some reason. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I know that they love to discuss about the, the appearance of uh, pyramid structures that is uh, being created during more or less the same time in both South America, uh, Northern Africa and in Asia. Yeah, or maybe... Not so much the as pyramid were, of course, older than the American. But again, eh, it's one of the easiest way to build high stone monument. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we, we, when our ancestors uh, built uh, tall buildings, they uh, of course needed a, uh, a strong fundament. Uh, so. Uh, a pyramid structure uh, is uh, well was the most suitable structure for holding up the roof, so to speak. And ever encountered people at a gathering or party that when they learn that you studied archaeology uh, comes with their own theory or strange theories that they've heard. Yeah, I, I worked uh, for a very brief time at a hotel uh, in uh, Scotland where uh, uh, the woman who were supposed to teach him about the trait, uh, she asked me about uh, the pyramids actually in Egypt because she said that she had seen on TV that the the there were aliens who built them and uh, no man would be able to build such a structure. So uh, it was, I, I didn't really know what to uh, answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was so surprised that, uh, well, well, she seemed to be a normal person. Uh, uh, I didn't believe mm. that normal persons actually believed in that. No, you you become quite speechless when they usually put you on the spot. Like, uh, have you heard about those uh, Bosnian pyramids? <laughs> <But> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> but uh, uh, we we teach people today in our society to uh, hold on to their beliefs and to question uh, everything, more or less. But that. That has yeah, led and, to um, that we are questioning facts and make up our own uh, theories and think that our theories without any facts are as strong as uh, scientists who devote their lives into a subject. Yeah, and uh, even dangerous to do your own research. It's, it's fine to look something up looking up something on wikipedia isn't really the same thing as doing proper research and sure you can gather gather the education by reading yourself but it would be a harder process for you to peer through the academic language that they have in the more advanced textbooks 
and really get to your proper own con conclusions. Um, so it's easy to read pop science and think that's science because it's published in a book. Yeah, that's correct. And there are also a lot of uh, people doing podcasts uh, as, as this one who, who do not have any knowledge about the subject. They just find the subject interesting and do a podcast and express themselves as being experts uh, in the subject. And uh, for qualifying as an expert, you have to read about the subject for one evening, then you know everything. Course. Um, but how about we dig into the meat of the episode? Yeah, sure. So we open up with a question What did Thomas Jefferson? Christopher Columbus, the Crusaders in the Middle Ages have in common? Did you get the an answer to that one on the first try? or? Well, uh, no, uh, I, I didn't. Um, I suppose that the TV show's uh, answer was that they had an encounter uh, proof of extraterrestrial life. Yeah, but uh, I could not really fit them together. Uh, sure, the title of the show uh, gives the answer away, maybe, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, the, um, I, I assume that the, the title was uh, meant to uh, uh, capture more uh, viewers. Probably. And we move quite quickly from uh, this little opening sequence where we also meet Mr. Billy Barnes, maybe to Eric, quite unknown, but uh, a frequent flyer on the Ancient Aliens uh, TV show. That just gives us a quick blurb and then we move into the t test. Which actually was quite interesting, to be honest. The whole uh, nuclear test site and the Manhattan Project. Yeah, the, I, I had some problems with uh, understanding what they called proof. Uh, they were discussing uh, ancient uh, folklore in uh, India or, or or it was Pakistan. I don't remember right now. But uh, yeah, they. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They start with the uh, the Trinity test site talking about nuclear test and Manhattan object, and they quote uh, Doctor Oppenheim's famous quote there, and it's from the oh uh, Bhagavad Gita, uh, the Indian uh, text. And they quickly move on to Brahma weapons. And I think they want to connect the nuclear test site with the Brahma weapons to show that if we had nuclear weapons that looked like this today, then the descriptions in these ancient texts must be uh, depictions of nuclear warfare, basically. Yeah. And um, at the same sequence, I think they are showing a. An excavation site uh, that they found in uh, India, uh, and they were, were discussing uh, similarities between the uh, nuclear test site in America and India. Uh, the problem is that when they are discussing radiocarbon dating to the Indian site, is that uh, uh, well, nuclear weapons messes up uh, new, uh, new, uh, carbon dating. Um, the unstable isotope. Uh, uh, you, you can't measure its uh, destruction uh, after we have used nuclear weapons in the world because the, the nuclear weapons do release uh, carbon uh, C14. And 
considering that and they were using nuclear weapons back in those days well if that was the case then we wouldn't be able to use radiocarbon dating at all actually so i had some trouble understanding uh, some of the proofs here <laughs> yeah um i don't think they really thought about it that far and this is a common theme within the ancient aliens that they take one snippet of uh, an ancient text preferably in something that's not really known within the American middle class on university population. Uh, so, for example, uh, they talk about the Brahma weapons from Indian folk tale, and they don't really specify where in a hundred thousand verse epic they got this. They just say, oh, this is the part where they, they depict um, uh, depict the nuclear warfare trust us on this you don't need to go and read it by yourself so for example we have nancy red star who has been in a few episodes um, used to be a indian more native american uh, and she talked about the brahma weapons and she don't mention that there's different Brahma weapons. I'm not sure how good you are at the Indian uh, religious epic. Uh, I, I do not know that much, to be fair. I'm not an expert either, but apparently there's a few Brahmastra uh, weapons. And the different gods had their different weapons, just like Odin had his spear, Thor has his hammer that type of thing and one of these could produce a fireball that could kill an opponent if he didn't have the proper counter weapon basically and when he used the weapon according to the epic the earth would shake glaciers would melt and the area where it hit would become dry and have no rain for 12 brahma years which is 37 trillion human years <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and it's basically a way to for the ancient people to describe how desert become. Yeah. It's quite fas fascinating that they had knowledge about this uh, time age uh, about <laughs> how long <laughs> it would be a desert. <laughs> yeah, so it will be dry for 12 Brahma years, so if you have the time you can just wait it yeah. out. <laughs> And same with um, Giorgio. I think you know him, seen him before, the meme guy. Uh, I know that there were one guy in the show that I uh, 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 noticed that I had seen before. I don't know where from uh, uh, I have seen him, but I have seen him. And he's just doing some kind of motion like this in the meme. Yeah. yeah. Aliens. Yeah, okay. That's the one, yeah. I, also, <laughs> I didn't remember exactly what it was. Yeah, that's Giorgio Tsukalos. Tsukalos. Uh, anyway, he's one of the more famous uh, people uh, due to the mean alien. Okay. <laughs> uh, but he also talked about their depictions of uh, uh, radiations. Um, again, they do this part where they take something out of context. So he he's saying, quote, you need to look at the whole picture. Descriptions of explosions that were brighter than thousand suns, light twirling in the air and trees went up in flames and mass destruction. People who survived the blast started to lose hair and nails started to fall out. And if you heard that, and you don't know the context, you, you might think, yeah, that sounds like a nuclear blast. But I did find what verse he was quoting. The, the Yuda Kanda, 22 Sarga, verse 31. The streets swarmed with rats and mice. Earthen pots showed cracks 
or broken from no apparent cause. At night, the rats and mice ate away the hair and nails of slumbering men. Okay. So that's where you have the nails falling out, and it's not really an explosion uh, in connection to that verse. It's, you know, uh, a bad omen that something bad would happen to the village. Yeah. Basically. There, there are a lot of those uh, uh, omens or folklores all around in the world. And if you really want to find one that uh, is similar to your theory, then I guess you just have to dig until you find the perfect one that matches. Or you don't even need to do that. You can just take something not really give the source for it and hope that nobody <laughs> double checks. Sure, it gets harder and harder within the internet age, but uh, they're still trying. Uh, one Daniken, who is quite famous, uh, ancient alien proponent, he was among the first one, and I think he makes an appearance in this episode too. Uh, but he he usually do that together with uh, Sakurai Sitchin that have translated his Sumerian tablets all by himself. And of course, those translation goes widely apart from whatever the mainstream apologist claims. Yeah, well, there are a lot of people who like to do their own research. Uh, when we used to study archaeology in the island of Gotland, uh, there were uh, historians living on the island who also created their own uh, facts even published mm. books uh, of course they owned the, the book publishing company so it wasn't that hard to publish the book <laughs> but uh, claiming that uh, several groups of people the goths and so on uh, were originally from uh, other parts of the world uh, in uh, which you could compare with uh, the scientists uh, that had uh, totally different uh, opinions about the matter. But um, I, I mean, if, if you really want something to match your theories, then you, you can make it happen. It's, it, it's not that hard. Uh, if you no. close your eye at facts and uh, open your eyes at, um, well, your imagination, then I guess TV shows like uh, Ancient Aliens happen. Yeah, and something I wonder for myself is, are they doing this because they just believe it very much, or are they grifters, basically? Because I do... Some feels that they're genuine, that they are just cherry picking facts to get their theory to come up. Some, I get this feeling that, yeah, you don't really believe this. You're just saying it to sell, sell, sell a book and you will change whatever message needed to sell more books later on. If somebody would start to push back on your original theory. I do uh, actually believe that these people who are uh, commentating uh, in the in the show are uh, genuine in their own beliefs. Uh, uh, there were, well, uh, there would of course be other people that are trying to find some kind of financial benefit also from it. But uh, the way they are expressing themselves, it 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 sounds genuine to me at least. Mm, I do have my. My feelings about uh, Giorgio Socalis and, of course, one Daniken that will appear in a few moments. But, um, but other than that, most people seem to be sincere, at least, or yeah, that they are at least believing that aliens were here and they're just trying to get the puzzle to fit. Yeah, uh, um, but, I mean, we we. There are a lot of people in this in this world we are living in that do believe in a lot of things, and there are a, a lot more crazier things that you could believe in than ancient <laughs> aliens, actually. So, yeah, 
What, what, uh... um, be worse. It could be better. There's this the dangerous part with it. You know, you could say, oh, but that is just a silly belief, but it stops people from actually looking for truth. And you also have this quite racist undertone of it, because if you would watch the whole series, you start to realize that, yeah, they're leaving out Europe for a reason, even when Europe was brought up. So, For example, in the next where they talk about Stonehenge, they don't question that. Uh, the British people could drag these 50 ton blocks uh, 10 kilometers or more by themselves. They just built it to talk with the aliens, basically. Why the Egyptians could not have built the pyramid since they lacked the knowledge. The same with the Inca or Mayan. Okay, well, if that is the fact which <laughs> I do not know anything about, it's a really strange uh, way for the TV show to do something like that because uh, the, the the cradle of civilization comes from the rivers of Euphrat and Tigris, and those are not situated in the UK. <laughs> yeah, and uh, even that they away from uh, the people uh, it was aliens of course that showed them city planning and okay. waste disposal and <laughs> grid layout and all of yeah. that of course but apropos cities we move into mohenjo daro that you briefly mentioned here the place where nuclear war took place yeah uh, uh, if- I, I, I thought that it was a really cool uh, ex- excavation site. Uh, it really got yeah, me interested. It is. And I even added, uh, we will add it in the show notes, but I did add the uh, excavations protocols uh, from 1937 and 1931 from the original excavations. That's quite interesting. So it was found in 1922. Uh, and was excavated by uh, a marshal and a Mackey until 1931 at least. And then, of course, it's been excavated in different cities. But it's a quite interesting city, to be honest. Uh, but, of course, it's claimed to be the site of nuclear war, where skeletons are scattered across the streets and... It was abandoned to climatic changes or whatever. And the show is really amazed that bones have not decayed. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that. Uh, there is one sequence in the show where they actually also show how deep into the ground uh, these bones and structures are found. And, well... It's not hard to understand if they are so deep into the ground that they have survived for such a long time. Uh, what I didn't catch, though, while watching uh, that, this episode is how uh, how uh, how old the site was, because they are briefly mentioning that the Indian people thought it was from one time age, while the, the Paki uh, thought it was even older. So uh, the mainstream archaeologist, as the show wants to call us, <laughs> it puts it somewhere active 2600 to 1900 BCE, okay. basically. So it's the old, not the oldest city, but um, decent enough. And something that might be good to understand about the area is that it's really hot. Uh, so it's basically the desert they're dwelling in. So they, of course, are quite left out to the elements. Uh, usually in the summers, you have 42 degrees Celsius. American listeners, that's 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, and everyone knows that in such places, there are a lot of predator animals running around and eating every piece of flesh they can find, which uh, was the yeah. most episodes. <laughs> Yeah, in the episode, they want you to think that the skeletons, 44 of them, uh, the show claim, um, at least were scattered in the streets. 
that if you go back to the records where they first found it, you start to realize that it's not 44, it's more like 37. And sure, you can call it a street, but I think most of us would call it a cemetery. So, and I think there was something like a thousand year time span between the oldest skeleton and the youngest. Okay. For sure, a nuclear missile might have destroyed the C-14 datings, but yeah. at the same time, uh, 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 did you notice a material the city was built of? Uh, well, it looked like uh, uh, what we would call brick uh, bricks in today's society. I guess it was uh, stones, actually. Uh, uh, mud brick. Yeah, it was mud brick. Okay, yeah. Do you remember how mud bricks are the best protection against a nuclear blast? They are. Uh, there are reasons why we call... Uh, I actually don't know this word in English, but a uh, jordkällare in Swedish that could hold the blast for a nuclear device. And what the jordkällare is, is basically uh, well, a small um, mound structure uh, that it looks very fragile at the first impact. But yes, uh, they also mention in the show that the, the, uh, these graves, that they are untouched, that uh, no wild beasts have been scavenging. Um, considering yeah. that the, this is a place in the middle of the desert, then yeah, I think people can understand why uh, there are no, not that much wild animals roaming into this town. Yeah, and even that, if you bury it uh, into the ground, the scavengers won't really exit it easily, especially not in the middle of the town, to be honest. Uh, people would chase them off from their cemetery. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to use my brain right now and try to recollect uh, what's the biggest uh, predator animal living in the desert. Uh, uh, vultures <laughs> uh, uh, and they're not famous for their digging no <laughs> <skins>. they're not <laughs> <laughs> but you have bears and such in Pakistan but they're not really scavengers um, either well, well no and you have no bear that lives in a desert because considering how the the fur on the bear is built up uh, they, they would perish quite uh, fast yeah yeah it seems as most scavengers in Pakistan and South Asia are mainly birds vultures of course uh, for the most of it but I'm not really sure there to be honest uh, might be some predators, but again, I don't think they would have access to the gravesite in the town. No, uh, of course not. Easily, at least. Uh, but uh, the, the the town itself was really cool. Uh, it was the, the the thing that I appreciated most uh, of this episode. Yeah, and the, the pictures they had, I'm not sure if they had an actual crew going there or if they used uh, stock photos of it, but the photo was was really nice. I, I like, It would have been good if they had made it in a proper document. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah <laughs> um, actually, yeah. And I, I really like the, the photo that is shown in this uh, clip where there's a guy standing uh, on top uh, of the old fundament uh, of the buildings, hmm. and there, and it shows how deep into the ground they are. No, it's a really nice sight, but their feather in the hat on this section, at least, the gotcha question is vitrification that they found, or the epicenter of vitrification that the show put it as. Do you know anything about vitrification? I have no clue at all. 
So vitrification can happen by several reasons. And uh, there's several natural processes behind it. So one is named uh, fulgurite, which is basically sand fused by lightning. And you have uh, tekitite, which is sand fused by a meteor. You have something called frick, which is pottery that's been fused by fire. So the basically the glass uh, shell on a pot, it's vitrification. And uh, of course, to tie it to the beginning, trinitite, which is sand fused by a nuclear explosion. So what type of vitrification do you think we had in Mohenjo-Daro? Well, I'm definitely sure it must be, have been nuclear. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, my, my speciality when it comes to the Stone Age is actually pottery. So I do know a lot about uh, heating uh, mud uh, and so on. Um, so uh, uh, a natural guess would be that uh, that we see here is from uh, uh, pots, uh, pots uh, and pots. Yeah, uh, you're right. It's frit that they found. Basically, they don't say this in the episode, they just say a huge epicenter. But if you go back to the original notes from the excavations, you do find the term epicenter. But it's a very small epicenter, closely tied tied to a kiln where they burned ceramics. So you have an epicenter of a meter, just a phrasing from the archaeology at the time. That would yeah. sound very likely because um, at this time when when people manufactured pottery, they 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 would have a a, a place for it, of course. And hmm. so, the uh, f- finding an epicenter of the the, the, the pottery would uh, would sound very natural if this is a small town. Yeah. And- Again, I don't really see that it would be strange for an archaeologist to find uh, vitrificated pottery shards by the kiln of the where they burned pottery, basically. Uh, but it's one of these moments where, again, they tell you something that's in theory true. They just don't tell you all truths behind it. They just the words a little bit. And let your you fill in the blanks by yourself. Well, th- that's very nice of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't say they are lying. They're just not telling you everything. No. So sure, there's vitrification by nuclear explosion, even called Trinit- Trinity test site. Of course for vitrification found in this area would be trinitite. It's like the old, uh, you know, you say in the color white and then trying to trick people into saying um, water or I don't remember how that game went. I I have (laughs) no idea what you're talking about. I'm so sorry. No, but you're saying... um, and the goal is to trick the into saying that the cow drinks milk. Okay. I don't remember how it went. Anyway, it's a digression. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at least I used to play it when I was a but yeah, that was some time ago, to be honest. Yeah. The the, the, the show uh, loves to uh ask questions uh, without actually answering themselves. Uh, uh, I guess it's supposed to be like that, so that the viewer uh, should be filling out the blanks, the the, the answers to the questions. Um, Yeah, uh, because they put these questions up in a certain way, uh, usually give you some alternatives, like a false diachromy. Uh, so you will pick the most obvious one or just 
lately to fill in the blank. Okay, we speak about these strange things in this town. You heard about nuclear explosions, therefore the aliens had atomic weapons. That they apparently fired upon themselves because we have Giorgio uh, talking about you not find anything about this quote where he got it or anything, but there was a war between three giant city up in space, basically. And they saw all these explosions in space and the fire rained down on Earth. So space battle explosions yeah would not uh, really go hand in hand no 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 the, the he doesn't say so much about this uh, but uh, apparently there were three sky cities uh, fighting against each other uh, so well once again, uh, it's convenient uh, to use uh, folklore uh, into your science uh, when you want to try to prove your point. Yeah, folklore is quite easy to rephrase, uh, but this part feels basically just as, oh, look, they depict some atomic warfare in space. Therefore, it must be aliens. But again, they don't say where they got this. So I think we can just gloss over it, uh, to be honest. To mention that uh, nuclear heads will exist within space. And then they put in a bit of a filler. Also something I noticed that they really want to hit the 130 mark in this season. So they put in things that's not really related, such as Sodom and Gomorrah. So, you know, the old Bible story where Lot yeah. saves a couple of angels uh, by offering uh, the mob who wants to defile said angels with his uh, daughter instead. Uh, and God thinks he's a, such a nice guy that he will let them escape. Um but they can't look back because then they will have bad things happen to them. But of course, lots turns back and turn into a salt stone. And that's apparently why you don't look at the nuclear blast. I'm not sure where they wanted to go with this, but. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, I, I really tried to understand the. the uh... Uh, how how to connect these two things together, but I I I, I really couldn't find one. Uh, uh, I was trying to understand. And okay, salt. Thing... May, maybe there is something about salt here, but no, no, no not even that. <laughs> no, it's just that you should not look at the nuclear blast. And why they saying you should not look at the nuclear blast? You see scientists with the binoculars yeah, yeah. looking at the blast. <laughs> Apparently. Skies are fine, but I guess it's something don't look into the sun sort of matter. Wear your sunglasses. But yeah, it felt basically as we need to hit a couple of more minutes. Let's put in the Sodom and Gomorrah story and say that you can't look at the nuclear blast site. Yeah. Therefore, the Bible has nuclear weapon. Yeah. Because God is not God. He's an alien, basically. Yeah, But that... The production that has made this TV show, uh, I think they have done a, a fantastic job. Uh, I mean, it it looks great. The the, the storyteller, the the guy who is uh, trying to make us uh, believe in everything, uh, he has a really nice voice to listen to. Uh, yeah. So, so it, it it is. Uh, I, I think the production has made uh, uh, something great about something. Uh, uh, well, well, I don't know actually how to describe it, but they have made something out of nothing, and that's a good job. Yeah, the if you look, compare to the first episode, they have long way to be honest. The first episode, the computer animations look to be. Have done by somebody's nephew who didn't really want to do it but you know he knew something about computer the production team said okay uh, but they're 
getting better and better. And by now they have quite a huge budget, to be honest. We're okay, talking so, so this is actually a show that keep on going today. Yeah, they launching episode yeah, last week. Okay, okay. They are on uh, season 17, I think now. Okay. <laughs> and they actually have a big budget for it. Yeah. But, well, it is good TV. I, I, I say that it is it's really good TV. <laughs> yeah. Um, would have been nicer with some other. They just think about what they could have done with all these resources and competent editors and producers and they could have been top-notch documentaries to be honest yeah yeah uh, well i i see to, to be fair i don't i do not see a problem with the tv show unless they are trying to make people believe in everything they are saying if they are trying to make a hocus pocus show then it's all fine by me. But uh, I guess it's about how they uh, turn up and say things in a show that makes it, uh, if it's a good show or not. I I actually think that I need to watch this show a bit more now to (laughs) make up my (laughs) mind. Yeah, you're welcome back. As I said, you have a couple of episodes (laughs) to shoot from. (laughs) Yeah. But we then, from the loot story, uh, move into the Black Sea Dolch hypothesis. They don't call it this in the episode, but after a lot of research, I did figure out that they're basically aiming that uh, a Robert Ballard, who's actually quite an accomplished, um, do you call it, um, not a marine archaeologist, but he have done a lot of uh, marine explorations about Titanic, most famously. Uh, one of the people who first went down into the wreck and also made a lot of different uh, finds of, especially ships uh, in Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And he has this theory that the Black Sea went into the Mediterranean, basically. So overflowed and flooded the Mediterranean area and uh, raising the sea level with about 150 meters or 500 feet for those American listeners. Um, But again, it's... They don't really say what the hypothesis is or goes much further than they found Something like they claim 200 sunken cities in the Mediterranean. I look into that. And there's a couple. If you count in the cities that Earth has slid the harbor into the Mediterranean Sea, basically. Yeah, they they show a map uh, of the Mediterranean Sea when they are trying to tell us that there are 200 cities lost uh, under the water. Uh, what's f- fascinating about this map is that they are showing dots on it where these uh, cities uh, should have been uh, uh, but they, these dots are like scattered all over they're not like they are close to the to the beaches uh, today <laughs> no 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 on the biggest depths uh, of the mediterranean sea we do have sunk cities yeah yeah because they want you to think that whole islands disappear i assume but again if the water level changes with as they say 150 meters the islands won't really get to the bottom of the mediterranean (laughs) to be honest and well the sea level as you know haven't risen 150 meters since ever basically yeah, I, I mean, the Mediterranean didn't experience the Ice Age as people uh, did in the northern parts of Europe. And uh, northern parts of Europe are actually still today rising uh, uh, after being pushed down from the uh, glacial ice. Um, so um, I, I didn't know about this theory about the Black Sea and Mediterranean. Uh, I, I, 
I think I need to read about it to understand the, how someone can actually believe in it. Because there's actually been connections between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. So Black Sea was actually once a water lake, if I remember it correctly. But due to uh, a sort of, not flooding, but uh, rivers opening up, connecting the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, it the water changed that. Uh, I'm not an expert in any kind, so I can't really go deep into it, but it's actually a quite interesting thing to read about that I either didn't know before watching this episode, so I learned something by mistake. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, uh, that's what I mean. I mean, the the show is fantastic in one way, uh, and uh, yeah, and not so fantastic in another way. Yeah, Yeah, but that part... um... As I said, the Black Sea deluge hypothesis, if you want to look into it, that's the uh, Wu version. But um, yeah, Black Sea and Mediterranean were connected. And that part would be interesting to look a bit more into. And so we are at the Black Sea. And what is Black Sea the most famous for? Are you asking me that? Yeah, uh, I don't think I get any answers from the listeners anytime soon. <laughs> 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 well, uh, what is the Black Sea most famous for? Uh, I, I don't would not actually know how to answer that question. I think you need to help me with this one. So you have the Black Sea Scrolls that you might have. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, okay. Yes, of, of course. And I think that's why they wanted to have that hypothesis here. In a way, uh, you don't know this, but in the last episode, we actually talked a lot about the flood myth and they didn't mention this at all during this. But I think they put this in this episode to have a nice transition and have everything connected in a nice way. It's good storytelling, to be honest, but that's why you get this maybe weirder theories from time to time. Uh, but uh, what do you know what the bell? About the Black Sea Scrolls, I, I, I do not know. Um, I don't know much about them. Uh, I have never been uh, reading anything that uh, involves them, uh, but they are filled with uh, biblical uh, texts, and I, I, I do not know if they are all biblical, but a religious text uh, at least. And I think there are also. Uh, one of the oldest scripts you have ever found, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Yeah, it contains the oldest, uh, not script, but um, papyrus script at least, preserved. So you have older stone carvings that survives, but the oldest, at least paper, and oldest biblical stories, uh, many of them not necessarily included in the modern Bible or Torah. You have a few apocryphical uh, text, especially one that uh, Van Dan again, uh, the guy in the blazer and his books beside him, fronting the camera if you didn't notice, uh, he talked about the Lamech scroll, which I was not familiar with. Uh, A cool thing actually uh, that I noticed is that the entire Dead Sea Scroll library is available online if you want to read it yourself. Okay, cool. Uh, Is it translated into uh, English? Most, but not all. Uh, So it's a project that seems to be ongoing. And since some texts are basically um, tiny, tiny fragments, uh, not everything is readable even. But um, this Lamech scroll that Van Daniken speaks about is one of the original seven that was um, found by a few shepherds in uh, or near the Black Sea in a cave. Actually, the scrolls apparently sat on a pillar in the little tent city that they lived in and were basically found by mistake by a American or British um, excavator in the area who Notice it that those scrolls were not Arabic and looked very much older than it should be. So that's basically how it was discovered. But uh, the scroll, uh, known 
to others as the one Q20, since you know how we like to name things easy. Yeah. Uh, among archaeology <laughs> and anthropology and all other fields, uh, it's also known as Tales of the Patriarch and Apocalypse of Lamech. And basically, Van Daniken, do you remember just the titel? Uh, I'm trying to uh, remember the right ones right now. Um, and is, the, is this the part where he also starts to speak about uh, Noah's Ark? Yeah, so the story he's telling is basically the origin story of Noah. So Lamech is Noah's father, according to the Bible and the Torah. And his wife, uh, Bathenosh, according to Van Daniken claims that she's pregnant, but no one touched me. So you get, you know, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. artificial semination that I think he wants to call it. So he goes to his father, uh, Methelesha, uh, who says, I can't help you, but you should go to my your grandfather, Enoch. And Enoch says that the guardians in the sky has made an artificial insemination of the wife and that he should just accept the child. Except if you would go and read that scroll, you notice that it differs in some key points. So yes, Lamech's wife is pregnant and gives birth, but Lamech isn't worried about not having been with his wife lately. He is worried that uh, the child is too pretty. Oh. Has a too pretty face, you know, and apparently he don't find himself that handsome or something. <laughs> <laughs> So he goes to his father who says, I don't know, go to and talk to your grandfather that says, well, uh, he is more beautiful because he will be the leader of the new people. Basically, he will survive the flood and leave the humankind to, next, uh, to the next adventure, basically. So, so maybe that's the reason that why they are showing these hideous skulls at the same time. Yeah, that's a tie-in to... So if you read the Bible, you will notice that in one passage of the Torah and the Bible, you have reference to giants. And I think that's part of the story that Van Daniken wants to tell you is that uh, the wife Bathanos was, well, maybe not with one of the giants, but the giants were the aliens. And the J aliens inseminated Bachenos. That's why you see these strange skulls on the screen. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't understand well, the, the, the importance of showing these old skulls uh, while watching the episode. Yeah, they have these deep cuts that you have to watch the entire thing to <laughs> really connect, I think. All oh, right. oh, by Odin, what have I done? <laughs> well, uh, why do I know this? things but um so they talk a little bit as you say about the flood and for a race that mastered their stellar travel and apparently used earlier or later atomic weapons i'm not sure why they would go with a flood of all things it no. feels like they had more would have had a more efficient way to Maybe there is an answer to that, like the answer they are giving in the episode where tr they are trying to explain that Noah's Ark maybe wasn't an, an ark. So maybe the flood wasn't actually a flood. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't really get this part. And a fun, fun little notion that I noted is that they tell the Noah story with the two of every creature part is not what actually says in Genesis. It's God actually demands seven pairs. Oh, is that? The, I didn't know that of, actually. Of the clean animals and then a bit less from the unclean. But the two of every is not referring to how many to collect, but two of every kind. So you get a male and a female. So Noah don't show up with just male animals seven of each species yeah because that wouldn't work of course uh, but well two a male and a female and seven pairs 
of every animal on Earth. Okay. The boat is a lot bigger than you would actually uh, think yeah. of it. But, but uh, I mean, in the episode, they, 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 they are saying that there wasn't actually a boat. No. This is, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a boat, because that would be quite ridiculous. Yeah, uh, of course. I think even Giorgio, uh, the meme guy, say that the story is ridiculous, because how could you fit all the animals on a boat? No. It's a DNA bang. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Um they do not tell though how uh, how Noah was able to uh, use his scientific methods to uh, extract uh, the DNA from the bank later on and create all life again. But <laughs> I guess it comes in the late later episode. <laughs> Shh! Don't ask question. <laughs> no, especially and then how we went around gathering all. DNA before the flood uh, is basically somewhere in Israel, I assume. I'm not sure where Noah story is located. Um, to be honest. Anyway, but he went all across the world. So he went to North America, Australia, and then he had to do all the trip again after the flood. He takes the genes, he makes a new kangaroo, and then he needs to go that one all the way to Australia. Or would the aliens help? Uh, well, well, so again, it feels like they could do it a lot easier. Yeah, than to yeah. Let them... I, I think it, it, it feels like it is a mission impossible for Noah actually here. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I do not know exactly how many species there are of uh, insects and uh, mammals in, in the world. Uh, there are a lot, uh, I don't know that, uh, and trying to locate all of them and uh, br- bringing them back to their natural environments, uh, I, I, I simply feels like it's a task not meant for a man. Yeah, on the other hand, I think Noah turns 900 years or something like that in the Bible. Oh, so it oh, okay. be uh, something there, but again, yeah mastered interstellar planet and DNA clone technology, I think there have been easier ways to do this in general. I don't I do not understand why they would use Noah at all, but uh, I don't <laughs> think we should go into that either. No, again, don't ask questions, just nod and watch. And then they talk a bit about the um, seed banks, that's a modern or quite modern invention. So you have the one in Svalbard who house something like hundreds of thousands of plants. Uh, or as they say in Norway, Svalbard's globale frövel. And they want to say that this is basically a new invention, but in it's basically a safety deposit box if a, a nation's or institution's emergency samples or their own biobanks fail. So the bank in Svalbard is mostly for a safekeeper uh, keeping and it's actually been used latest in the Syrian war where the infrastructure got really bad and they actually deposit a few of their samples in Svalbard. But uh, gene banks is not a new thing. They have been around since at least early 1900s. And there's one in a notable example that I know in uh, Pavlovsk in Russia, uh, who during the siege of Leningrad had 12 scientists die of starvation while they protected the edible seeds inside during the whole occupation. Wow. I didn't know about that. That's really cool. Yeah, the whole... That story is... Pretty nice. I think, don't remember correctly, but I think one of those scientists that survived actually found a woman dead in the street, and those two uh, were parents to uh, Putin. Oh, shit. Okay. 
So, yeah, well, the, uh, the, 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 the gene banks that, uh, like the one they are showing from uh, Svalbard, um, that, that's, I think that's really cool, actually. And I, and I think we all do uh, realize why they are being used. Um, but uh, I, I haven't heard of an uh, example yet where they have actually used uh, any seeds uh, from the, the, the bank. Uh, they have only yeah, filled that's... it, but I haven't heard they have they used something from it yet. Yeah, that's Syrian who made a deposit here 2017, I think, or 16. Yeah, but that's because a deposit. They... I mean, uh, withdrawal. No, uh, withdraw. I mean, I. Oh, okay. Uh, my English isn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so what what kind of seeds were they actually withdrawing? Uh, I don't really remember at the moment. Just notes. But it it's when for I... agriculture, I guess. Yeah. So yeah. it's only plants and for okay. agriculture purposes. So you don't have animal DNA or something stored that. For that, you have the frozen arc project that they even mentioned in the episode where they try to save um, of DNA from creatures that uh, are on the brink of extinction, at least, yeah. to save keep for if we can recreate them later on. But the gene yeah. banks are purely, purely for food, basically. Yeah, F feels like we went a little bit uh, off topic here when we started to discuss actual <laughs> real science. <laughs> <laughs> so, how about we dig down in some uh, folk tales again from the Middle Ages? Oh, that sounds lovely. Because we move on from the seed banks directly into Otia Imperialis, basically. They don't say this again. They don't really give you the ways on how to look it up by yourself easily. But Billy Barnes, uh, who is uh, quite a character uh, in this show, but he talk uh, about the sightings of UFO during the Middle Ages all over the world, from Scotland to England, all the way to Italy and Turkey, and that's the world. He stops there. Yes. It was of the four countries he could name. <laughs> Scotland, England, Italy, Turkey. <laughs> yeah. The, the, um, the, the paintings uh, they are showing in this episode uh, who are supposed to uh, show uh, uh, UFOs. Uh, I, I, I do not know if it was just me, but there's a big similarity between the UFOs and uh, actually suns when they're actually showing sun rays all around them <laughs> yeah uh, you're actually skipping ahead uh, a little bit but oh sorry I like them too <laughs> uh, no 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 worry we, we we will dig all into them i even put some examples here in the notes you can go back and relive the little moment <laughs> but they're talking about the uh, otto imperiali and i think the story is quite sweet um, they give the lazy, uh, boring version, but uh, it was written by Gervais of Tilbury. And he made a couple of books. Um, two of them were the, uh, his uh, books. And then he had one extra, basically, with folk tales. And one of these tales tells about uh, aerial craft above Bristol in England who uh, had an anchor caught in a church. Of course, Billy Barnes here want you to believe that alien that they're depicting. But if we read the whole original text. So I will just break in here a bit in the after production. So the text we're talking about is from the Otto Imperiali. It goes as following. A strange event in our times, which is widely known but nonetheless a cause for wonder, provides proof of the existence of an upper sea. It occurred on a feast day in Britain, while the people were strolling out of their parish church after hearing high mass. 
The day was very overcast and quite dark on account of the thick clouds. To the people's amazement, a ship's anchor was seen caught on a tombstone within the churchyard's walls, with its rope stretching up and hanging in the air. When after a time they saw the rope move as if it was being worked to pull up the anchor. Since being caught fast, it would not give way. A sound was heard in the humid air as the sailors struggling to recover the anchor they had cast down. Soon when their efforts proved vain, the sailors sent one of their numbers down, using the same technique as our sailors here below. He gripped the anchor rope and climbed down it, swinging one hand over the other. He had already pulled the anchor free when it was seized by the bystanders. He then expired in the hands of his captors, suffocated by the humidity of our dense air if he were drowning at sea. The sailors up above wa- wasted an hour, but then concluded that their companion had drowned. They just cut the rope and sailed away, leaving the anchor behind. And so in memory of this event it was fittingly decided that the anchor should be used to make iron works for the church door. And it's still there for all to see. Yeah, and these medieval stories, they are meant to be taken literal, but at the same time, not really. Um, have you heard the stories about the dog, dog people? Dog people? Yeah, that's an example from medieval texts. So monks in medieval ages had huge discussion about the dog people that were said to live somewhere in the world. Um, they had bodies as human, but um, heads like dogs. And the question was, do they have a soul? We need to save them for God. People. So there are a lot okay. of these different uh, strange creatures that share the medieval world. And meant to be taken both as a thought example and as a literal thing that we should go and find, basically. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's a nice story, of course, uh, about uh, this uh, Ottia Imperials, Imperialis. Uh, it, it sounds like it could be one uh, great book to read uh, before nighttime. It's quite sweet. They have a lot of fun stories in it. Uh... And it's not that expensive. You can even find free copies since uh, there's no copyright on it any longer. <laughs> okay. In most cool. cases, but it's it's a fun book to read. It gives you a mind into the head of the medieval world, and from this we move to the paintings. As you said, it was your favorite. Uh, well. There, there were so many of them. Uh, I, I, I couldn't stop from la- laughing when I watched this because it, the, uh, yeah, I, I, you, you see, I'm, I'm lacking words. I, 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 I do not know what to say about this because it's, <laughs> well, it's, it's really fun to watch uh, if you want to have a good laugh. Uh, uh, my, my favorite perhaps was when uh, they were describing a, a picture of uh, God and Jesus uh, and saying uh, that uh, the similarities between it and uh, Sputnik. <laughs> I knew that you would select this. Um, <laughs> and I like this. And the thing is, did you know that it's just a part of a whole painting? No, I didn't know that. That's not the whole painting. So underneath you have a bunch of priests and a whole church sitting and having a ceremony. And it's a fun picture. So you have the little ball um, that they, Jesus and God are looking at and two metal uh, rods, basically, in their hands. And then there's a dove above it. So if you know something about... Uh, painting in the 1500s 
uh, you know that this painting that they don't give you the name, uh, but exhalations of the Erukan Ecu Ecuristi by Ventura Salimberry or what? Salim Beni. Uh, but you have Jesus and the dove, the Holy Spirit, and God, of course, and they holy holding not metal antennas as Georgie put it, but they hold it uh, scepters, you know, like the old kings. They didn't always have the big uh, golden huge things. If you look in the medieval uh, paintings, most of them are quite thin looking uh, wands, basically. And the fun thing I th thought is that Bruce says that it's impossible that they could show uh, the earth as a sphere because everybody at this time thought that the earth was flat. Yeah, I, I, I actually had a discussion with one of my students uh, a couple of weeks ago when I tried to explain to her that the uh, the well known fact that medieval people believed in flat Earth ain't actually a fact. Uh, I think the the theory comes from an, an American philosopher or something like that. Who, um, it's that might be one of the resurgence, but basically from the start, it was spread as a way to. For the Protestants, after you know the split between the Catholic and Protestant Church, to cast you know basically troll the Catholic, showing oh they're so uneducated that they believe that the Earth is flat. Yeah, I, I was trying to explain why modern people, uh, people living in our society today, are actually still believing it, um, and, and I think it. The, the, there was an American who is the fault for that, uh, who who described medieval uh, time age in uh, Europe hmm. and used one map to show what uh, people thought. Yeah, I can believe that, to be honest. I just know about the Protestant uh, thing, but to be honest, people since at least the ancient Greece would laugh at a claim that Earth was, especially if they had some sort of education. Uh, yeah, maybe there, if is, you... there is no recollection in the Bible saying that the Earth is flat. Uh, there is actually, uh, I think it's in one place in the Bible that where it says it's round. And considering yeah. that the people during this time saw the moon as a round object, the sun as a round object, uh, it would be hard to believe that these people then thought that the Earth was flat. But you are correct. There is a passage in the Bible uh, describing the Earth as a sphere. And fun thing, Giorgio, that here actually tells you that they couldn't believe it because they believe the Earth is flat, actually say in a later episode that people knew that the Earth was round. Therefore, they had spoken with the aliens. Uh, okay. Uh. So that's why I, you know how I said that I get the feeling that some aren't very sincere in their beliefs. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I try to uh, I start to understand what you're trying to say here. <laughs> so they might change depending on what they want to prove at the moment. Yeah, okay. I think it says in this episode that the vast majority uh, of the people believe that the earth was flat. So in his defense, he's not saying that everyone believed that the earth was flat, <laughs> only a vast majority. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we can give him an out, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm trying to be nice at him. <laughs> he is a meme, so you, you need to be nice at memes. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh... <laughs> But we can we can pretend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also like the um, 
depictions of the sun and moon that they claim are people driving spacecraft. Yeah, they they are uh, the the vehicles as they describe them. Yeah, and they especially talk about uh, a painting called the Crucifixion. Easy uh, in the Visoki Dekani Monastery in Kosovo. Of course, they don't tell you where they just say in a monastery in Kosovo. But if you understand Byzantine art, you know that it's a quite common thing to depict the moon and the sun as people. I'm not sure why, but you will find it in other parts. So if you look in the notes, I have a French depiction there where you can see on the cross the sun and the moon depicted as two discs with faces on them. Yeah. So, I, again, one of those things that, sure, if you want to play pretend, uh, you can claim that they are vehicles, but for an art historian, uh, nothing new or extraordinary really there. No. Uh, I also like when they are speaking about... Uh the alien powers coming from the sky showing the uh, some kind of a s- strong sun ray or something like that um the it looks like they are the the painter shows the the rings that you get on the water if you're dropping mm. an object into the water and um, but the people on this show are misinterpreting uh, these rings into something else. Claiming it to be uh, a UFO instead. Are you talking about um, laser paint? Yeah, it might be, uh, be the laser paint. Uh, I don't know which one you, you are just, uh, trying to describe right now, but there were a painting where you see a... It looks like a sun ray co- coming down from the sky in diagonal into oh, a yeah, house. Oh, yeah, that's the laser paint. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's the laser. Yeah, yeah and, where and they... if you look where the, where the ray is coming from, it almost looks like there are rings uh, around it in, into the clouds. The kind of rings you would get uh, if you drop a stone into the water. Yeah, and that's another thing that they tend to do. So... You know how low resolution images are the best to use. Mm-hmm. I have in the notes a high definition version of it, a bit small, but I guess you can zoom in a little bit and you will notice that those rings are angels. Oh. And so the, the angels are part of the cloud and they are protecting God, who is the cloud, is a very common depiction in the. Uh, medieval scene so you will see god as a cloud or a piece of fire quite often but uh, the rings are angels but sure if uh, you look at the low resolution version yeah you can see that it sort of ufo like but it's one of those tricks that they tend to fall back to use bad pictures and then tell you what it depicts and you will fill in the blanks of course the most fun part is when the for me when the laser hits the little dove. <laughs> <laughs> so either the space aliens are shooting doves um, while <laughs> inseminating um, Mary, or or it's God in the cloud surrounded by the angels, or and the Holy Spirit that's depicted as a dove in many other paintings, or it's an alien. Um. The obvious answer would, of course, be alien. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think Eric burned on us. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, this, this, it's interesting that when we are living in a time age where we want everything to be exactly how it is said uh, or painted or shown. Uh, if we back the tape a couple of years, we we used to say uh, that we we could say one thing, but actually meaning another thing. But that doesn't really work in today's society because today you actually 
must say exactly what you are trying to say. It, it can, uh, so it won't be mi mi misunderstood. So these paintings are, of course, showing one way, uh, but they, they, are, they are trying to be, I don't know what the word to use here, but they're, they're, they're trying to describe something from their own ti time uh, line. Uh, mm. and we, we have tried to describe things during uh, the whole time people have been on the uh, world uh, in different times uh, in, uh, in different ways. Uh, so it, 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 it becomes a problem when we are in the society today trying to take something that is not meant to be 100% correct shown into something that we want it to be 100% uh, shown. Hmm. I, I don't know really how to explain this. I'm, I'm sorry. No, but I guess what you're aiming at, you're talking about artistic license, basically. Exactly. So, you know, you want to depict something that's a quite abstract thing as God. How do you depict a shapeless, formless being properly? Yeah, maybe as a cloud, some light. And if your church say that the Holy Spirit comes as a white dove, yeah, you put dove in there to really hammer in the, the yeah. symbols that would be known to a person during this era. So a person from... Uh, it was painted by uh, Crivelli in 1486. So yeah, the 14 or 15th century person would definitely know exactly what was going on in the painting. Uh, while a person today might not recognize the symbols that's depicted if they haven't studied or are very active in the that type of community. But yeah, they usually use it and they usually twist it as the people saw something. So in the show, they claim that Belly probably saw a UFO, didn't know what he saw, but that's why he depicts uh, God as uh, a UFO, basically. And they usually bring set up that, oh, they don't say, of course, that they saw a UFO. They depict their, it in their own language. And... That's why a dragon isn't really a dragon. That's why a dragon is a UFO, of course. Both spits fire, both are green, eats, naps princesses, you know, things yeah. that aliens do. Uh, uh, it would be interesting to know uh, why, why, if the producers in the TV show would actually explain to us watching it why every time the, they are showing a UFO on these paintings, there are sun rays coming out of it. Uh, it doesn't really make sense to me. I think they want you to draw a conclusion towards, you know, the propulsion of the spacecraft because they use rocket engines. <laughs> Maybe because in other episodes they don't use rocket energy, they use mercury or uh, electricity uh, and other things um, but okay, sometimes okay. the spaceships use rockets and sometimes they don't it depends on time and place and what they want to tell you basically yeah okay but if we move on we leave it and leaving the paintings we to the plague which of course must be aliens. You know, they flooded the earth first and then they need to call the population again. So they use the disease, I assume. Yeah. How does that make sense? It would, for an alien, I would buy the plague more than flooding. Yeah, they are trying to explain that this is alien made because there weren't uh, so many written sources from this time saying that rodents were a big problem. It, it's like they are trying to say to us, oh, it was only the rats who uh, were ho 
keeping the plague on themselves that when people got uh, the disease, they couldn't uh, actually uh, transmit the disease to other people. No, no, no. It was always <laughs> the rats. Yeah. And this part is actually way after this episode was aired in 2010, as mentioned. But actually today, there's theories that it wasn't rats. It was more corrected to gerbils. Uh, so I don't remember at the moment I just to think about it now that a lot of things have happened in 12 years and it's actually in relation to the gerbil population and especially their mating habits. People I don't have... know what a gerbil is actually. So a gerbil is like a hamster. but Okay, okay. And all the zoologists will write an angry email. Yeah, no, it's not the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, but close enough. <laughs> okay. From my understanding, at least, that uh, they were actually never the rats who were holding the plague. It, it was the fleas that were sitting yeah. on the rats. Yeah. That's... Uh, but but the, the, the gerbils were actually a new theory that I haven't heard of before. Yeah, it's still connected with fleas, of course, but we shouldn't blame the rats solely, but the gerbils. Uh, the rats have taken too much shit. <laughs> yeah, they need to uh, get the sum of the blame. But it's a new theory. I can link it later. But just something I came to think about now that I actually uh, read. But they talk. They talk about clouds, yeah. cigar-shaped clouds, and I've never heard about the cigar-shaped clouds because I don't doubt that it might be reports in journals as they say about strange clouds but cigar shapes in the 1300 i don't really buy on the other hand uh, since tobacco wasn't in europe yet mainly um, but there's some theories that the plague was miasma so yes that they talk about gas or mist is quite logical that's actually why the plague had this giant um, beaks, giant beak, big mass stuffed with things. Actually, the mass would probably help them not get in the plague since it's an airborne disease plague and the gloves and everything they had on them, but they didn't connect it with bacteria since they didn't have germ theory back then. But they feel this mask's a uh, good smelling thing because it's a was actually until really really late that we stopped believing that miasma was a thing basically bad smelly things will make you sick while good smelly things will keep you healthy it's kind of logical but at the same time not if you live in filth you will of course get sicker more often but it's not really a hand in hand but um, yeah so miasma was something they believe spread is which they cure with good smelling things or in some cases even worse smelly things so you had the doctors with their flower beaks and people who hide out in the latrines because they thought being in a very foul smelling place would drive out the plague miasma Interesting because it smelled theory. too bad yeah, um, they even had theories that you could cure uh, cure the plague by spreading human uh, human feces in your wounds. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that won't work. Yeah, um, and they talk a little bit about. They don't talk much about this, even though it's a quite interesting subject to play at least i think so and they talk a bit about matteo villani which really isn't the right person they want to talk about giovanni villani who were the one that spoke about the plague and he made a journal entry that's quite chilling he don't talk much about the disease but he's depicting the way uh, how at least the uh, Italian 
uh, merchant class saw it, how it come to uh, Italy as such. And he leaves this little chilling last word. I again and just chime in. So the passage we're talking about here that Giovanni Villani left blank goes as follow. And of eight Genoese galleys which had gone to the Black Sea, only four returned, full of infected sailors, who were smitten one after the other on the return journey. And all who arrived at Genoa died, and they corrupted the air to such an extent that whoever came near the bodies died shortly after. And it was a disease in which there appeared certain swellings in the groin and under the armpit, and the victims spat blood, and in three days they were dead. And the priest who confessed the sick, and those who nursed them so generally caught the infection, that the victims were abandoned and deprived of confessions, sacrament, medicine, and nursing. And many lands and cities were made desolate. And this plague lasted till... Then it's empty. Because Giovanni died after that. Couldn't write in when the plague ended. Okay. But they are right that uh, Matteo is sort of related. Matteo is the brother of Giovanni. Who started to write continue the writings, he wrote history, basically. History encyclopedias. And Matteo fills in after, but he don't talk about the plague. Neither does his son, Filippo. Um, I think the mist that they talk about running through the streets actually refer to the Danish folklore. Because I haven't found much about mist in the rest of Europe, but the Danish had tales about mist moving through the countryside, swallowing the village after village. Well, the, the mist have always been evil. There are never good things written about the mists. So, uh, yeah, it it's, a, very... it's a logical thing and the same that the black... <laughs> I'm not sure if they're trying to say that the aliens dressed up in black and uh, with scythe outside the... Villages. Um, yeah, the Green Reapers. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> they want to connect the Green Reapers with sky like staff spreading mist. I couldn't find any relation to that. I think they're talking about the Momentum Mori, uh, the French tradition that occurred during this. It would translate to something like, remember that you're going to die. They are a very happy period in human history. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think Sometimes. we can relate, sort of, <laughs> today. <laughs> yeah. But um, it was a popular theme to depict death and the Grim Reaper and death in general, uh, especially during the plague year since, well, I think it's two-thirds of the population was wiped out. Yes, uh, it, it's an awful time in the human history, of course. Um, so, the, if you, we need to understand the pictures, the paintings, the text from this time, and take into consideration how many people who are actually dying. Uh, this isn't the happiest of times, and. Um, it's quite well shown uh, in the in pictures uh, or, or paintings where where you see uh, decapitation, skeletons dragging people into hell and so on. Yeah, it's very it's a very grim period, and sure you have a lot of dancing and such too, and happy stories, but most of them are quite grim. And I would assume if you lose most of your friends, family, village, you you might not go and write flowery poetry the next day uh, or paint a beautiful landscape for quite some time. 
so we need to watch these ser- well pieces of art in their context and not as the yeah, ancient exactly. alien theorists break them out and put them in a modern context because then we, you will get this weird weird result uh, to look at them through the eyes of the middle age middle dark age person basically to get yeah, a proper understanding. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we do today uh, when it comes to the hobby historians and, uh, and the people behind productions like Ancient Aliens that they are tr- trying to translate uh, ancient texts and ancient uh, paintings and so on uh, into a modern way of thinking and, and uh, how we in the modern society are describing and picturing the things. Uh, it's impossible to do that. It's it's so wrong that I can't even describe it. Uh, if you are trying to understand something shown or written that is several thousands of years old, then we need to do it with the eyes uh, that were used when creating it. Hmm. Uh, yeah, we can't break it out and look it with our eyes always especially when we talk about art since that's highly suggestive to the person and the time it was created in a way yeah, we can't really um, break it out and put it in a little bubble in modern times and try to find parallels that probably wasn't invented yet that's why depictions of UFO always are with the technology in the you don't really see UFO described with, I don't know, as uh, these big ships until quite late because due to pop culture and scientific advantages and the aliens rarely have weirder weapons than we do. But yeah, yeah. it's... But it, it, it is shown in this episode that the people who are discussing the subjects do know a lot about UFOs. Uh, I remember one guy in this episode saying that uh, a, a common method for aliens is to disguise their ships into clouds. Yeah. So he, he knows this. So he, he, he knows this for a fact. So... <laughs> Yeah, so you can photograph a cloud or a spaceship, uh, depending on who you're asking. They also like to hide in the waters, because aircraft usually do. Um, But I think it was Bill Barnes who said it, and he has a lot of strange quotes. Remember in an earlier episode, he says something like, the more you try to disprove me, the more I will believe my theories because I know then that they are right, basically. You know, as scientists do when you criticize yeah, them. Yeah, that, that's, that sounds very scientific. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Billy Barnes we might need to take with a grain of salt when he speaks. But yeah, he's super sure that the clouds are aliens. I'm not sure if it's all clouds or just some clouds. He don't really specify how you recognize an alien cloud from a normal cloud, but you need to buy his books for that, and I haven't got around to it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the perfect Christmas gift. Yeah, you will get one of those. <laughs> <laughs> the At the end, when they're talking about the plague, I, I, I was having some problems here to find how everything is connected in in the episode because the plague was it felt like it was li- a little bit taken out of his place yeah um, i think they wanted to tie it up to the flood that they talk about wiping out the population and say that oh this is a more high-tech version more closer to our time but i'm not sure why it why they put it here i think they try to fill out some time again but i'm not sure if they're I can see the tie, at least to the flood myth, maybe. But again, it's positioned weird. If they don't aim for a chronological sort of approach to it all of a sudden. No, it feels like 
the whole episode is made out of uh, small clips put together. Yeah, sometimes they you can find the thread, but sometimes they are just. And then we have this, and that one, and then a third, and now we're back in the main narrative that we named the ep- episode after. But yeah, it goes from time to time, and just as yeah. what we will probably close out on Columbus that we mentioned early here, uh, but apparently Columbus on UFO. Yeah, well, I I think this is very interesting, but for some strange reason that the people who are going out to explore the world who comes to new continents uh, or finding new travel routes and come to distant lands that no man from their own continent has been before they all of them are finding ufos hmm. uh, as they do yeah uh, the the columbus story with uh, seeing this uh, uh, glowing object uh, coming up from the water or how it's described yeah I, I, on the 11th of October at 22 or 10 in the evening apparently Columbus was walking anciently on deck as the show describes it and see a light glimmering in the far distance and I actually found that passage in his journal so he described it like a wax candle basically that moved up and down far far away yeah, and, and I was thinking about this because I know that there are uh, uh, glowing algae. Uh, I don't know there are glowing uh, jellyfish uh, and so There's on. So I, glowing, I, I, I was yeah. trying, but I don't know which ones of these uh, species that are living uh, uh, around uh, Cuba. Yeah, I looked into that a bit and you have a squid that apparently glows and you have a a species called let's see I had it written up here the fireworms Uh, the worms usually live on the ocean floor but they usually swarm to the surface to mate uh, and then do a little uh, dance that shines in the meantime and apparently they just do that for a little while and then the lights go out um, softly. So it could have been something like that or something else, but it's hard to speculate what a very light shimmer might be a couple of hundred of years later. I think yeah, it's of course. one of those times that we... I know that many people don't like this, but sometimes we actually have to say we don't know. Or at least we don't know right now what it was. No, but the, the, what's interesting about this, because if if Columbus himself believed that this was a UFO, <laughs> then it, it, it should be written all over text from this time. Uh, the yeah. contact with a, a, a life that they only saw in the distance, glowing and so, so on. But we, we do not find these texts, and there must be a good reason for that. Uh, the show has an idea. But yeah, I went through his notes that's publicly available online, as with all other things. But uh, the show claims that Columbus wrote down, and apparently there's this um, interrogation with the uh, Spanish or the Inquisition, because apparently Columbus, according to the legend, uh, or the Billy Barnes character again, claimed that the light looked like a menorah, you know, the Jewish uh, seven-headed candlestick. So one of his crewmates, uh, Gutierrez, I think they call him, reported Columbus to the Inquisition, 
and the deposition it's very long and he says what he saw and that it came out of the water and uh, everything and everything and the only issue is, is that I think it's um, Lafayette. He looked like a French Lex Luthor. Um, but he claims that this document is secret and hidden away in the Vatican vaults. Of course. But they know it because reasons. <laughs> but you can't yes. look at it. You have to trust us it on this. It is amazing how much people know about <laughs> that no one has seen. Yeah. yeah. Can't access either because uh, yeah. it's well guarded. Yeah. All these conspiracy theories and also I say they are very bad at keeping secrets. Some rando people can just stumble upon them with no effort it seems like but all the scientists and uh, journalists and other that could make millions and millions of dollars just proving a proper alien or this secret document in the Vatican it 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 brings me back to what i said a little bit earlier about uh, today's society uh, in today's society you are you are you must prove that something is incorrect for it to be correct. Uh, For example, if you can't prove that people have landed on the moon, then it's a hoax. Yeah. Yeah. So instead, we we have turned the tables around. If you back the tape like 100 years, you had to say, come up with the the truth or a, a story that um, were supposed to uh, say something that wasn't uh, told uh, as a, the truth. Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm lost here. You, the difference today between 100 years ago is that you need to prove that your theory is right instead of disproving it, the theory. Hmm. Does yeah, that we make have, sense? yeah, we have put it a little bit on the on the side yeah, so to say the scientific method has gone through the windows ancient aliens theories are and of course flat earthers and others are quite good at um, you need to disprove my theory I don't yeah, exactly. need to give you the evidence for it while it yeah. should be the opposite well, you're making a claim you should have solid evidence. And if you had, we wouldn't really have this discussion, really, because if you come with the evidence and that really shows, yeah, this is aliens, they have landed here since Middle Ages, and this one is named Paul, would get all the credit in the world, and nobody would continue if you could show them, but they can't because they're probably not here. No. Or haven't been. The, the problem is when we when we make up our theories today it is that we treat them like facts. It's yeah, like and the many theory... people don't have the skills to really differ what a good source is from a bad source. No, but I mean, as I do work as a teacher, we teach the kids uh, to question hmm. what is written. Uh, we need uh, we teach the kids to to find. Uh, different sources that so the sources can validate uh, what what's been written uh, but today we we accept something uh, uh, very fast uh, at least some of us do uh, hmm. like the people in the ancient aliens because if no one can prove them to be wrong then they are correct yeah. yeah, and that's the so, uh, sad part uh, that we um, are a bit st- between each other. Yeah. yeah. And something uh, I think normal people think is that a show like Ancient Aliens probably is vetted by expert and therefore the information contained within the show are 
true because why would it be on TV if somebody haven't made sure that it's correct information given? So I think we have a issue there that they don't really give any alternative views to what's presented or anything else and therefore it should be just accepted as truth from authority basically yes because a, a tv show uh, a, a channel like history channel yeah that's has too. been around for uh, several years i don't know how old the channel is but if a show will be broadcasted on that channel uh, people would assume uh, that it there are a lot of parts at least of the show that are historically correct mm. uh, instead of a, a show that is made up totally on the theories uh, of uh, made by people who are in very many ways different from uh, a, a normal uh, scientist and i yeah, I can agree with that. And I also think that it's a good place to put a pause on the episode. Yeah, so, let's go back to Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eric, what was your impression so far with ancient aliens? Have you come around to their theories? Uh, uh, like, like I said, uh, I think it's a, f- a fantastic TV show for amusement. Uh, I-, I would never watch it to to uh, <laughs> learn something, but because th- th- this is uh, <laughs> the show you you should be watching if you want to learn something. Uh, but but uh, I-, I find it very entertaining. Uh, so therefore, I think I will actually watch some more episodes. Yeah, it would be fun to have you back here uh, talking a bit about <laughs> the show. <laughs> and what was your favorite part of it so far? Any... Uh, uh, my, my favorite part wasn't actually... Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, the, all the, uh, the, the facts uh, or myths that they are speaking about. Uh, my favorite part is how convinced these people are in their own beliefs. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> and worrisome. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the, these are uh, awesome people in one way. Uh, and uh, yeah, very, very interesting people. All right, let's close out episode seven. Okay. Thank Hunters part two. Thank you, Eric for joining us yeah, this week. Thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, be here. Thank you again, Eric, for giving me the time. Don't worry, listeners, he will be here for the conclusion of Close Encounters. But until then, remember to leave a positive review anywhere you can, such as iTunes, Spotify, or to your friend at the trench. Remember to visit the diggingupancientaliens.com to find more info about me and the podcast. You can also find me on most social media sites and if you have comments, corrections or suggestions or you just want to write an entire email in all caps, you can find my contact info at the website. Until next time, keep shoveling that science. <laughs> Nej, det känns att ens engelska är så jävla bristfällig. 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 Jävla bristfällig.